OK, so that was quick demo in terms of uh, all the different capabilities right inside Visual Studio uh, that that we have added. So IDE support, SDK support. Uh, we have command line uh, based support, CI CD. Uh, very quickly, let me go in and show you uh, since you guys are probably familiar with Azure DevOps. So on the Azure DevOps, uh, the release pipeline, uh, when you add task, you could pretty much filter it by AWS once you enable the AWS uh, from the marketplace and we integrate right inside Azure DevOps where you could give us the code, we do the build or you could give us the binaries and we actually do the hosting uh, wherever you like. Uh, you can integrate with a uh, different level of abstraction like Beanstalk or Lambda. Uh, you could very well do custom set of calls. So uh, let's say you want to upload it to S3, right? So we give you kind of a other uh, task which you can use. Uh, and then once you, it's basically an abstracted level. So you just have to give the information about, okay, which region credentials it goes to, and then it, it will take care of deploying it as part of your release pipeline. So those, those task libraries are published by us. So we support Azure DevOps, as well as we have our own um, CI CD uh, services that we integrate with. And we'll be talking about them more a little later. Okay. Um, any questions here? Uh, if not, I'll move ahead. Good to go? Yep, I don't see any questions. Okay, wonderful. So if we got the toolkit, we also have Visual Studio Code support. Um, uh, CDK, as I said, it's kind of uh, uh, infrastructure as code. If you want to generate CloudFormation templates from C-sharp code, you use the CDK. Uh, and then we have command line based uh, supportability, PowerShell support, same thing you configure and you use the PowerShell commandlets uh, for each of the services. .NET CLI for deployment and integrating with your uh, end to end CI CD pipeline. We integrate with Azure uh, DevOps too. Okay, so you saw the quick uh, demo. Uh, the key is installing the uh, toolkit. Once you have enabled the toolkit, you get uh, different options. Publishing the Explorer, and the SDK, all along together. Uh, .NET SDK. I mean, there's pretty much all the services that we uh, that I showed you at the start. Uh, almost all uh, have .NET. So .NET is kind of treated as a first-class citizen on AWS. .NET and Java SDK. And there are other SDKs also, but uh, .NET and Java are, are definitely the first to come out. Uh, what does actually enable? So SDK is the underlying theme. Uh, you, regardless of where you call from, uh, you call from PowerShell or to Toolkit, uh, you pretty much are going to the uh, SDK call. And there are different editions of SDKs. Uh, right now, it's the version three. Uh, there were two. There were different versions of SDKs before. This is one pattern that you want to understand for any services on AWS. This is the pattern uh, for the call. So you have a service name, service name dot model. So you can think of like EC2, EC2 dot model, S3, S3 dot model, and then you create the client for that service, and then you have a specific operation that you call. Uh, depending on sync or sync, you will have the suffix uh, 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 sync, and then you could do a callable. So that's pretty much like regardless of which service you're using, this is this is a template for all those services operations. Okay, here's one example: list object async. We just saw the demo where I created S3 client, I called uh, the list object asynchronous library, and iterated through the uh, object that came in and and responded to it. We saw the command line uh, that we have. Uh, we PowerShell .NET CLI extension. Uh, .NET gives you uh, pretty much like if you want to do containerization. So let's quickly see one more demo here. Uh, you go here. So you saw the application here. You see, I also have publish container to AWS. So in this case, I'm able to actually get this application containerized. The actual image uh, uh, being pushed to our uh, repository ECR, uh, the container repository, and exposed uh, completely abstracted from you. So you do, you're not actually working on underpinnings of AWS ECS service, ECS task. It's abstracted from you right from the wizard. You are able to deploy applications uh, on, onto AWS. Similarly, another level of abstraction, it's Lambda. Somebody mentioned they are familiar with Lambda. We give you direct ability to publish to Lambda. 
So publishing to Lambda, publishing to containers, public, publishing to Beanstalk, all those commands are also available via the .NET CLI extensions. So uh, does this depend on the project type that we choose? I see when you right click, you are seeing the different uh, publish and option, and uh, there must be a different project type specific for AWS when you are creating very, the content. Okay. So when you do a new project, um, if you do like, let's say Lambda, right? So that's a, there are different starter templates uh, for projects. Uh, for container versus Beanstalk, the only difference is, I'll quickly show you. A new project. I'll do a ASP.NET Core Web application. Uh, let's just go with the default, right? It created. I choose model view or this one, right? And here you go. So you want Docker support, and which container do you want? Do you want Windows or Linux, right? Um, in AWS terms, ECS supports Windows containers. EKS support for Windows uh, containers inside Visual Studio is work in progress, but uh, using the CMCI CD, you could very well do that. So once you are, you could very well disable this and add a Docker file. That itself also will, so it's based on the Docker file existence in a project. Uh, and that Docker file is auto-generated. Uh, let me quickly generate this to show you. So here you go. Yeah, it's pretty simplified versions. It uses the Microsoft uh, base uh, and then it builds on top of it. So this file existence actually defines whether you get published container to AWS or not. If this file does not exist, that option will not be there. Similarly, if a project is of type Lambda, that's when you will see Okay, yeah, right now I'll cancel this. Okay, if I create a new project of Lambda, okay. Lambda is our kind of equivalent to, if I want to say Azure Functions, right? Okay, this is wrong. There you go. Okay, I chose the. Oh, cheers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let me open my own project, which I already have a deployed version. Okay, I have this as a Lambda function. Very simple. So it will generate the default uh, kind of boilerplate code uh, and the key uh, function which does the actual uh, work. So in this case, this does an image recognition client. You give an image, it will find out the attributes uh, from that uh, image. So that project will have a context to deploy to Lambda. But all of this are available via CLI extensions. So again, I work with a lot of fencers in, in New York, New Jersey, and most of them will have a CI CD pipeline, right? Uh, they won't do any of uh, them, won't do the right click publish. Uh, right click publish is primarily from a development, uh, uh, just testing uh, playing area kind of uh, feature. But when you have to deploy it, you probably either will use some kind of infrastructure as code, like Terraform. Um, templates in Azure or a CF and cloud formation in, in uh, AWS. Uh, and or you have your own kind of a custom pipeline, like some customers have a GitLab based, some have Bamboo based, some have Atlassian based. So in that case, they want to integrate the uh, calls and that's where .NET CLI extensions are very, very helpful to abstract that deployment. Okay, so as you can see, there are like ton of commands, uh, sub commands that gi it gives you. Uh, classic question like, hey, Lambda has, I have too many dependencies, what do I do? So you maybe you want to create a Lambda layer and use that Lambda layer across different projects so you don't have to duplicate it, right? I hope that answers uh, the questions that you had. Yes, yes, very well, thank you. Cool.
Cool. Uh, before I move further, I just want to make sure I don't want to do just a slide run through. Uh, any questions on, on so far what we have seen? Um, the supportability, the SDK, uh, the toolkit, the deployment, uh, what, what we saw so far. It's pretty amazing. I didn't know all this was integrated in Visual Studio. I'll have to load that stuff up. Yeah, I mean, that's straightforward. If you want to, you guys want to do it right away, I mean, let's go. You can do the AWS toolkit for Visual Studio. Get that installed. And there you go. You can you can right away get started on it. Our cool. extensions inside the, the Visual Studio itself. All right. Okay. So let's get moving here. If there is no more questions, I'll move to the next side uh, of the topic that I had. Um, everybody says, oh, you know, I understand the migrations point of view from EC2 or AWS infrastructure, but I want to understand the end-to-end -end development tools uh, that AWS has. So this is, we were trying to put together like all the capabilities uh, and still I have to add like at least four or six new features. Uh, so on the top left, what you see is kind of the AWS CI CD uh, services. So continuous integration, continuous deployment. Um, equivalent of Azure DevOps, but Azure DevOps kind of has end-to-end -end SDLC, uh, which you can actually uh, integrate with other uh, tools and then get that capability here also. Code build, code commit, code deploy, code pipeline. I think this is self-explanatory. Commit is our Git, private Git kind of equivalent. Uh, code deploy is the deployment to the actual uh, de uh, EC2 or container or Lambda. Uh, pipeline is the orchestrator. Like what happens, get the source code, do this. Maybe there is a, you want to put a manual review before actually it proceeds. So you could, you could do those kind of things. Uh, so that's our CI CD uh, toolkit. Let me quickly show you our demo on the same also. Let's go in the library. Let's see if I have a code star. This is basically a very quick way to get started on the AWS CI CD uh, tools. I'm going to change this to Oregon. Virginia, let's get in here. Okay, so that's one project. So let's open that project inside Visual Studio. Okay, here is the, so Visual Studio gives you a Teams Explorer. So this is a GitHub based uh, repository that I have injected. I'm gonna change this. If I see this right now, let's see, what do you see? It says, congratulations to the team, 520. Let's go in, I'll change it to 26. Okay, saved. Let's quickly do a sync. There is that file, commit, change, UG meet, user group, okay. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and publish this. We cannot see your screen. You stopped sharing the, uh, okay. the Visual Studio, didn't you? Yeah. No, I, okay, maybe I, can you yeah, see it? Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, that one change I'm gonna push and I'm gonna go back here. And that change should trigger the automatic deployment. Here I should see the commit history. It uses the GitHub actions. I should see the build here. And I should see the deployment history here. Just to show you end to end like code commit. Here is the commit change, code build history. And it started the build because I have just done an immediate change. If I go in, I can see the logs. Right, actual machine, what's happening? 
and I could very well integrate, uh, uh, let's say, unit testing, test coverage. Uh, in the same pipeline, I could have uh, partner tools like, uh, I'll give you example, a customer use place meter to do performance testing as part of the CI/CD and get uh, numbers to define if, if it has given me this much utilization across this, then you proceed the build. So you could, you could do that level of uh, integration end-to-end -end inside uh, uh, the AWS uh, CI/CD. The the key thing here is AWS CI/CD tools are pretty flexible in terms of whether you want to host the code here or you want to host. Let's say you want to host the code in Azure Repos. So you actually do a, a Azure DevOps integration task, and you get that uh, binaries uploaded to S3 or use code deploy to deploy it onto EC2 or containers or Lambda, and we take care of end-to-end, -end and we give you the native blue-green based support uh, that, that's available. If it is containers, we give you ability to switch between uh, target groups. Uh, if it is classic EC2, it's basically a DNS swap. So we give you that ability. If it is API-based service like API Gateway, we give you different versions that you can swap. So that's, that's pretty much end-to-end -end CICD. Uh, there's a lot of details there. Uh, we integrate with a lot of third parties here uh, because many of the enterprise customers have investment in, let's say, uh, Jenkins. So we integrate with Jenkins. Uh, Atlassian, we integrate with them. And uh, again, webhooks is one way of integrating, and other is basically how the customer feels. Uh, sometimes I have also seen customers actually want to do abstraction across multiple clouds. So they actually create abstraction tier, and they have their own API, so we integrate uh, that way also. So all of the services support uh, API-based calls also, uh, so that you, customers can actually call uh, from their abstraction layer. Infrastructure as code, it's basically CloudFormation and uh, Cloud Development Kit. Uh, CloudFormation is our uh, equivalent of uh, the ARM templates um, from Azure, uh, JSON and YAML. Uh, I don't like templating. I want to work on a typed language, C sharp, so Cloud Development kiss a Kit. And Cloud Development Kit gives you a very good reuse based support. So you could actually create code construct, and those code construct can be reused. So think of it like if you are creating something multiple times in nesting inside uh, templates, it's, it's hard. Whereas inside object oriented programming, it becomes very easy. Uh, we have a browser based IDE, Cloud9, um, and we have uh, kind of extensions for different uh, IDEs. Um, Visual Studio Code, uh, I showed you Visual Studio, uh, PyCharm. Uh, we also have .NET support for JetBrains Rider. So if, you, if any of you use a JetBrains uh, Rider, it supports a, a .NET uh, as a first class citizen there and gives you almost similar experience uh, that you saw. I mean, obviously Visual Studio, full Visual Studio gives you a little bit more. Uh, we integrate with Azure DevOps, uh, as you saw. And uh, this is another one, Coretta. This is our Open JDK uh, library. So the creator of uh, Java, James Gosling, is at Amazon, and he drove this project. So pretty much for production workloads, we have our own Open JDK. Uh, if you want websites that uh, amplify mobile applications, that's here. Um, the SDK that we have touched upon is just .NET, but we have several different SDKs. Now this is some of it. Now you'll say, Amit. What what happens to authentication and authorization, right? So we have something called Cognito uh, that you could use. Um, if you want uh, Active Directory, because many of the Microsoft uh, shops have Active Directory, so we integrate with Active Directory. We give you like many ways. Either you can actually create an Active Directory on AWS, or you could use managed directory services that we have. And uh, or if you want your on-prem Active Directory to be integrated, we have a AD connector which can call into on-prem and then do that way as long as we have the right networking setup. Uh, SAML Federation is supported out of the box. AWS by default has this concept of users, groups, roles, but pretty much most of the enterprises we will integrate with their, uh, let's say, uh, some kind of SAML layer federation. And if it's Active Directory, then we integrate with the ADFS. So you don't have to have any users created on AWS environment. Uh, we integrate with X-Ray. X-Ray is a service to do correlation tracing. Uh, and for any .NET application, you definitely want to know where the call stack is going, what's happening, how much time is spent. So X-Ray is another uh, service at the top. You can see monitoring and tracing. CloudWatch is more from an infrastructure point of view, like where you want to see uh, the resource utilization and set up alarms and, and get uh, maybe another workflow uh, from them and, and do a maybe scaling event and other kinds of. There is good amount of services. This is just a high level right from building to uh, deploying end to end. I, I have a question. How about yes. something like uh, Key Vault? Do you guys have 
the secrets vault of some kind? Yes, definitely. So uh, any data that you would bring in, obviously uh, encryption is, is the most important thing. So we give you client-side encryption libraries, so you could actually encrypt and then store. Uh, we have a service called KMS, Key Management Service, um, and we also have a service called Cloud HSM, that's a hardware appliance based. And we also integrate with uh, uh, SafeNet, Luna and others. And we also give you bring your own key. So uh, options uh, with most of our storage services. I hope that answers. Yeah, good. Cool. So let's get moving here. This is some of the partnership. Uh, as I said, I mean, CI, CD and DevOps is a, like it has so many different tool sets. So what we do is we integrate with most of the partners for different set of use cases. I gave you an example of Blaze Meter in CI, CD pipeline, but doing performance. Uh, there could be code review, so uh, Sonar Cube for integration. Uh, so there are different uh, integration flows that happens in CI, CD. Many of the large enterprises actually put a lot of intelligence as part of the CI, CD pipeline. So toolkit, you saw the Visual Studio team kit services. So pretty much task in the release pipeline and the different set of tasks that you that you see uh, that's available. And we, we are supporting a lot of uh, services and there's good amount of services that are there additionally going to be supported. This is one example of a flow. I'm pretty sure you, you have a different set of flow development kit. Now let's get into the actual discussion of uh, architecture that goes with uh, CI CD in the cloud world, right? I mean, legacy, you have monolithic, which is single pipeline, large single stack. So it's kind of a blocker. You want to move towards more smaller um, microservices or modern applications, smaller team, which owns end to end. That's the key part, right? So think of it like classic .NET based application, which is single stack. Uh, maybe uh, everything is in C sharp, uh, everything is in SQL server. Everybody has a one pipeline on through which they go. So classic like problems that you end up having in a monolithic based application. So the idea is split them into smaller chunks. Uh, it could be uh, services, microservices based applications and give them the complete ownership. When I say complete ownership, they choose which operating system they want to build, which language they want to build, which storage they want to choose. So the term polyglot frame work polyglot storage so give them the end-to-end -end ownership that's the key uh, idea and then you go towards more modern architecture support so when you go more to modern architecture support you will think in terms of giving each team complete ownership they own uh, design development coming on call at 2 a.m in the night to support this is just one example of how Amazon itself actually transformed. Uh, what you're seeing highlighted is that each one is a separate uh, microservice uh, and each one can go on their own. So end to end CI CD, right? So I will share something there. Let me see that slide here. I mean, this is very, very important. <laughs> like many times I see uh, this message of end to end CI CD speed is very, very important. But at the same time, actually getting a gatekeeper uh, security. Uh, so speed is important as long as it's not actually impacting the uh, security. That's, like sometimes it's- That's a, it's, yeah. that's a great slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes people, uh, like if, if I have InfoSec guy, he actually becomes very happy by seeing, seeing that slide because most of the CI CD actually drives this notion of like, how often do you do builds? Um, like uh, gone are the days like uh, I do nightly builds. No, hourly, okay. I mean, Amazon does like every half a second there is a build going. So you can think of the amount of scale uh, that goes. And people at top three, top sec two usually people understand the pillars, like how, how do I am moving towards their SecOps uh, pillar? But the bottom set of things is where the issue happens. I mean, if you really want to go end-to-end -end DevOps cloud native, you have to do other areas and automate them, like security policy as code. We have a service called config rule. So any service that gets modified in AWS, you can actually create a, a Lambda function, which can be called via config rule, Whenever there is a change in that resource, it will be called. So think of it like a database trigger. As soon as that DML operation is being called and you have a trigger to whether say yay or nay, the same way you can write code, which can check like what the developer is trying. I'll give example. Um, a developer is creating a run instances with creating a EC2 uh, of R48X large, which is very big EC2 instance type. So you could create a rule that says thou shall not be able to do it. So write that Lambda function, check, 
denied. So you could do a lot of things proactive. So governance can be proactive. Security can be proactive. The same way goes with, uh, let's say, event management, right? Uh, we have support SDKs. We give you ability that whenever there is an issue, we notify you. And you can actually take that notification and create a Lambda function and then maybe create a, I don't know, service now ticket automatically, right? So that that kind of use cases would help you go more towards uh, cloud native and, and, and DevOps world. Now that with that comes the understanding of architecture patterns. Um, we move from obviously this is this is classic and folks who like container, please don't get offended. I am a serverless fan. I should say that um, the lesser the operations, the happier I am because all I care is I'll give you the code, take care of the end to end scaling deployment on all the goodness of elites of an architecture uh, serverless gives you. Um, one quick differentiation, like depending on the abstraction tier, like if you are on EC2 or like a VM, obviously there is a lot of things that you are responsible for. I think somebody mentioned encryption uh, data. So obviously if you're bringing data onto AWS, you are responsible for making sure that it's encrypted, right? And you're responsible for what your application does. Um, the higher the stack, if you go to containers or if you go to abstraction tier like Lambda, the responsibility kind of shrinks. Your responsibility goes down and the AWS responsibility goes up. Like in Lambda, all you care is give me the function, and then I take care of actually seeing the request flow, scaling up, scaling down, creating that underlying container, because underlying Lambda is nothing but Linux containers, and installing the runtime uh, on which your uh, Lambda function is written. So if it is .NET Core, .NET Core uh, runtime, and then running it. So, and then killing it when there is no requests. So obviously you don't you don't pay for anything when, when there is no request. So that's the abstraction tier that you choose. Now, whenever we're talking about microservices, one is CI CD. So each microservice would have its own CI CD. They have polyglot storage and polyglot in terms of language and operating system. So from a storage point of view, I have been a .NET developer and I am guilty of putting every damn thing into SQL Server. <laughs> so uh, that's the classic uh, distinction now that happens that we have so many different set of uh, storage, right? And you want to go towards what is right for that particular microservice, right? If it is asset is important, then obviously you probably will stay on relational and, and maybe explore the managed op offerings like RDS, where I don't want to do patching and, and snapshot upgrade that is automatically taken care. So you can do replatforming, which is more use the managed layer, or you could look for what is cloud native. Uh, so let's say if you have something data that is more connected, right? It's social engineering or um, latitude, longitude, graphical. So that you could use Neptune. Uh, if you have time series, I mean, I have done SQL server based uh, stored procedures for time series and those were very, very hard. Now you actually have a purpose driven. So if you have time series data, you probably will use time series. So this, this microservices, the idea is like um, when we did a lot of SOA based applications, we actually split them into different services, but then everybody called the same storage tier. So if if the SQL server ends up having a schema change, the front uh, web services were breaking up. So the idea behind microservices is its own pipeline, its own storage, and its own freedom. The team has the complete freedom to choose tool set, uh, language, uh, and, and which stack they're, they're using. So that way they are not dependent uh, and they can move. I mean, there is still is dependency and that needs to be like, let's say if you have API based dependencies and each microservice exposes the API, then the classic API rules of whenever you are changing the contract, you got to notify, have a deprecation based. Uh, we have something called 12 factor app design uh, for cloud. Uh, I'll give you example. Um, let's say, I mean, anything that you're, uh, so classic if you take .NET, what we replaced a reference library that is load, being loaded inside the in-memory, we now call it over HTTP, right? I mean, that's a classic distinction. Now, as soon as you go over network, you have to think in terms of whether the network is up and, up and uh, running or not. So exponential back off in terms of if you tried, it didn't work out, you wait for certain, then you multiply that certain by N, and then you again retry. So that's one example of exponential back off. Similarly, there are different uh, cloud native design principles when you are making, uh, creating those APIs, and following those will, will give you more, uh, what do you call cloud native architecture? Okay, so let's just quickly see how does an application evolve on AWS because this kind of weaves all this story that we have done so far and, and gets you a sense of like how does an application migration, modernization actually evolves on AWS. This is classic 
a three tier application. Let's say they are in on prem, right? It's it's a, a web tier, API tier, and data tier. Uh, you have storage, you have Active Directory on prem. Let's say I want to get this onto AWS. And for the sake of conversation, I just want to replicate as is onto AWS. When I say as is, it means I am just running the same. Maybe I'm taking a VM snapshot and putting it onto AWS. So EC2s, right? So I got that EC2 and auto scaling. So at least I got something like auto scaling. It can go up and down automatically. So that's that's one good thing that has happened. But is this really an advantage of cloud? I mean, no. This is definitely not uh, not the reason. I mean, sometimes customers actually go to this because they may have a data center that they're getting rid of. Those kind of reasons. But this is not the reason. You want to go more cloud uh, native. So let's start. Uh, I want to do monitoring. I will use CloudWatch, enable CloudWatch uh, based monitoring. I may want to change the data tier to, I don't want to do uh, patching, upgrade, so I will use managed layer. So there is the RDS, which is a managed uh, uh, service uh, where it gives you the same endpoint, which you manipulate in your web applications and web services. Um, and then you slowly look for like, hey, my web tier, what just happened there? If you see the web tier, if it is a classic static application, like a HTML based application and JavaScript calls the API, OAuth based authorization. In that case, do I really need EC2 instances? Maybe not, right? So I'll put that into a S3 bucket and make it S3 bucket can itself act like a HTTP server. So there you go. I got rid of uh, my servers there. So from here onward, the goal is to get rid of servers. Go more managed, go more cloud native. So let's move further. Uh, I am going to now get rid of uh, the API layer. I'm thinking, what should I do? Maybe I want to have some kind of change in the API layer. Uh, we got the S3 bucket. Identity, we can integrate with Microsoft uh, directory services. So we have two layers here, either uh, managed directory services. So if you go managed, you kind of in simple terms, you lose the domain controller admin rights because it's it's a layering on top of it that's being exposed to you. Uh, and if you have to have a admin rights, then you probably want to just install directive directory on EC2 and use that. So we integrated that. Uh, and now let's go to API tier. And I am now hosting the same API via API Gateway and Lambda. So I chose Lambda as a backend implementation and API Gateway as the front. So API Gateway becomes my front to all the API calls. And because it's a front, it can do a lot of things like uh, maybe authorization, authentication. Um, it can do metering, it can do versioning. So a lot of goodness that comes with it. Uh, there are other things uh, like MuleSoft or Apigee and other. There are a lot of others out there in the same space, uh, which operates in terms of we also have service called App Mesh. So service discovery, right, and then orchestration of the calls that comes in. Um, in this case, the backend is Lambda. I could very well have EC2 as backend, or I could very well have container as backend. So I have seen some financial services customer actually evolve this. So they they make API gateway as the front, but they actually have a EC2 initially. Slowly, they modernize it into more container-oriented workloads, and then slowly, sometimes they go towards the cloud-native uh, Lambda-based workloads. And again, there are two different set of customers, like customers who actually want to have portability across clouds and have the same dev environment on-prem. They look to go more towards containers because then it's pretty much uh, you can move around. And customers who want to go more cloud-native and do not want to do any operations, they pretty much go towards the serverless stack. And if it is a new application, I, I definitely see a serverless-based implementation. So here I got API Gateway and Lambda. I decoupled the application to get queue and notification. This is classic pattern. Like if you have a synchronous call, you want to split them into asynchronous. Basically, caller gets notified that hey, I, we got your request. We'll notify you when we are done. Lambda takes it. Lambda does uh, processing, puts a message, and that message gets notified via the SNS. Again, all these are managed. There is nothing servers. You are you are not using servers. You are actually if I go and show you a .NET code, I probably have the sample for SNS and SQS also. Here you go. The simple notification service model, the same thing in the Lambda. I will write that down. I will notify it, and that notification will take automatically notify them. Right. So I got that split. This is a classic service rainbow. On the left, you see all what you call infrastructure, like kind of a EC2 based. So as you can see. EC2, MySQL on EC2, Hadoop on EC2, and then you slowly move towards abstraction tiers. So you go to managed, which is RDS, Elastic Beanstalk. So managed is us actually doing a lot of uh, heavy lifting work. And then you go more cloud native, so containerization, and then finally into the actual. So if you 
take let's take example of aurora serverless so aurora is our offering it has two engines postgres sql and mysql um, and and it, it does the job it has serverless it has multi master so you pretty much create a database with one checkbox it becomes multi master serverless available you don't have to do any work underlying to man like do the actual maintenance of that database all you get is the um, you can manipulate them via api or console and you get the endpoint and you start using them it's kind of one tenth the cost of the commercial databases and that's why you go more towards the higher level where you have to do less operations and you're focusing on your business kind of uh, uh, need what what that use cases that needs to be developed so hopefully that that gives you a uh, this is where customer starts. I mean, I should say, I mean, usually the conversation starter with the, for the cloud is kind of a cost and then slowly it becomes more elasticity native and then it becomes I want to do innovation much faster. And if you want to do more much faster, you probably want to be on the right hand side of, the, of this uh, tier. I guess I said a lot of things. I'll take a pause and, and wait for questions. Eric had a question, but he already left. The, he already left, I think. But he said, uh, "Why did you get the container published options on that app, but not the other one?" But I wasn't sure which one he's talking about. Like on a Lambda, you wouldn't get a container. You know, do you want to put this in Docker or not? As opposed to, uh, you know, like a core application, you can say put it in Docker or not. Yeah, I think I did answer that question. Maybe he didn't. didn't uh, okay. Or, or, yeah. So basically, a Docker file uh, support. If you add the Docker file support, uh, that's when uh, you see that option uh, to publish to uh, containers. Uh, other than that, you won't see that option to publish right. to containers. Yeah. If the project has Docker file, then you see the option to publish to containers. Right. Right, because you've gone through the Docker file being present. Yeah. 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 And some temp some templates will put that in automatically. Yes. So while when you're creating a new project, it gives you option like, do you want to have a Docker support? Mm -hmm. And if you miss that, then you could pretty much add a file and choose Docker, and that 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 does it. Was that too much information? Maybe that's probably it. Or there is no, no. So far. <laughs> I thought it was great. Sherry has okay. a question. Oh no, I know it's, quick, it's just quick, great uh, information. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Cool. I mean, my intention was not to overwhelm. I should. I should say that uh, I tried to keep, but I mean, it's just that there are so many services. Okay. Last but not the least, um, uh, what are the different paths uh, uh, when we discuss uh, my migration and modernization of .NET uh, applications? So let's take a legacy like a mi migration use case. So you may have uh, uh, either a WinForms, WPF, add-in based uh, thick client application, or you may have ASP.NET Web Forms or ASMX or WCF or REST-based services, right? So on the server layer, if you have web applications which are dependent on .NET framework, sorry, uh, you would actually look for two ways. One, get them onto EC2. That's Obviously, just as is, you are replicating the same IIS environment onto AWS and get up and running. You may get the goodness of scalability, um, alarm-based trigger, and that kind of thing. You could containerize them now that we have the Windows container and slowly getting maturity compared. I mean, still, I would say Linux container is way, way more mature than the Windows container. Uh, we have a service called ECS that helps you uh, with orchestration, uh, and it supports um, uh, Windows container. So you use ECS to containerize that legacy .NET framework based applications. So 4.5, 4 4.6 or old legacy .NET, uh, whichever is the CLR version, we will have a supported version for it. So that's classic path for .NET um, uh, framework based applications. Now customers who actually want to modernize those uh, .NET framework based applications, uh, we look to do some kind of analysis in that uh, and see if that can be actually ported or transformed into a .NET core based applications. And that's where a little bit of challenge happens. Usually if it is a service based application or a web application, it's it's a easier transformation and we could actually port them to .NET core. But if it is using some, it is dependent on third party libraries and it has a lot of external dependencies, it, it is sometimes hard to actually modernize them. So I, I, we there is a .NET uh, assembly analyzer inside Visual Studio 
uh, that can be called against any assembly and it gives you a pretty neat report of how many features you are using uh, that you will have to change or refactor to go to dotnet core and once you have an application in dotnet core then you have like several options you could go to ec2 you could go to beanstalk you could go to uh, ecs you could go to uh, lambda you could so pretty much all the runtimes that we have dotnet can go go dotnet core can once you have dotnet core you probably would want to go towards uh, lambda or containerized uh, linux container because it has a lot of goodness and the maturity of linux container is is more than compared to the uh, windows container uh, similarly it goes against the data tier also uh, right as i said um, rdbms was good before and we did so much maybe abused it so much but now you want to look for purpose driven and where and if you want to go towards um, managed you could explore rds if you want to actually go towards cloud native then you go towards serverless as i said serverless aurora uh, which which helps you uh, go multi region based deployment because if people who have worked on actually replicating and doing a sync replication they understand the complexity all that is built in I mean, serverless multi-master is is just a one check box, and and you're you're taking care of of that. So you you modernize uh, those, uh, and then there is goodness of uh, the cloud native automation, CI/CD based automation, ability to respond, and self healing based application. Uh, Twelve factor design principles that you apply, and that's that's together a journey towards modernization path. I did have some slides on migrations, but don't know if that is useful. Let me just quickly open that. But of course, all this migration is the same for uh, even in Azure, whatever you're doing with .NET, trying to get to core. Yes, I, uh, definitely, it, it's pretty much uh, the same. And as you all probably are familiar, uh, .NET is moving towards .NET 5, uh, right? And I did attend yeah. the build event. Uh, where pretty much .NET 5 is going to be the future, uh, which is becoming single stack and can be deployed onto, uh, they have integrated the Xamarin also. So phone apps, Linux, Windows. Oh, you. It's, it's, another, way, it's another way of saying that uh, Core is catching up with traditional .NET. Yeah, actually, that's that's In a good way ways, of saying yeah. it. Yes, yes, definitely. So we give you a lot of services from a migration point of view, like assessment. If you want to have us come and look at the environment, give you some kind of guidance, and you make an informed decision making, we do that. Uh, readiness and planning. As somebody mentioned like SA coming in and doing a immersion day. So this is I'm doing like a thousand fit. We have like a day or three day versions of workshops that we do and each feature we look for application understand the where it can be we do a poc and show how it can be done so we, we kind of give you that and there's tons of uh, tools in each area like when you want to do assessment or you want to do migration we the portfolio analysis and and based on uh, what comes out of that portfolio analysis is what you you use on top of it we give you a good amount of programs uh, that that offset some of the costs that could be uh, like you know when you're migrating or modernizing there can be significant amount of work uh, end to end ci cd pipeline is easier said than done so we we give you some programs that helps uh, getting that heavy lifting uh, in front of you so that was it, and I have a summary slide which shows the value part of it. Uh, reliability, again, regions, availability zone, data center is, is the key. Understanding that mapping of regions to uh, availability zone, and that tells you like multi-AZ design and how much it can support. Like if you have a four nines of availability requirements, multi-AZ pretty much satisfies that. Uh, unless you have, like I have fencers which have contract which says you have to have a thousand mile distance apart. In that case, obviously you will probably go towards multi-region based design. Performance, security, cost, TCO, uh, supportability. I wanted to have share one very neat resource we have recently created. It's a uh, dot net developer dozo uh, and it's then kind of a step by step guide um, and it builds so pretty much takes an application uh, you actually expose that via api gateway containerize get a authentication flow and then create a cdk add a ai ml use case so i'll share this resource uh, and you could you could pretty much uh, uh, do uh, this whole end-to-end -end workshop so that i mean usually learning happens more when you actually do uh, I mean, yes, presentations are great, but that this is probably the best resource uh, if you follow this step by step that gets you going on to uh, .NET on AWS features. 
But I did get uh, the Amazon Toolkit installed easy enough from extensions. On, nice. Uh, SQL 2019. That was quick. I'll have to poke around with it a little bit. Okay, cool. Thanks. So uh, we had um, Sam had his hand up. I don't know if he just accidentally hit the button or not. Oh yeah, Sam said it's um, just bad I was gonna ask about, uh, you know, the, the I I think most of my my questions got answered. Uh, it was primarily on on what, especially that migration path slide. Uh -huh. That was more more what I was gonna in line of what I was gonna ask about. So I think I think I got an answer to my questions. So thank you. Cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely. And and if you have further questions, feel free. Like, I mean, if there is a specific use case that you have, uh, and if specific application architecture, and and you want to take that, definitely, um, um, I'm happy to have a follow up conversations on that. If you could paste a URL for that dojo. Uh, yes. The, so I have like chat. four of them. So I'm gonna do okay. this. I'm gonna send you a email with four of those dojos, uh, and okay. it'll. Those are different paths. Like uh, one is a container, one is a serverless, uh, one is a classic migration. So I'm gonna share share each each one of them. Okay. I see Ray posted one of them. Oh, Ray is good. He captured it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you guys want to do another quiz? Sure. Okay. Let's do this. I'm gonna share my screen again. Is this, is this testing our after knowledge now? <laughs> <laughs> Did we it, get it? Did we get no, a certification it's, for it's, this? It's actually testing my own quiz. So maybe there is a bug in my quiz. So I just want to verify that. Uh, there you go. So we do the same thing. We go to kahoot.it. Kahoot.it. Uh, okay. And this time the pin is. Three zero one three seven two two. Let me go ahead and put it three zero one two two. Okay, I see seven players, eight. Yeah, uh, besides you, there's currently fifteen on the call. Okay, so it wasn't that boring, I guess. Then <laughs> I could <No>. just <laughs> people come and go. It's up to about okay. twenty-one. Nice. Oh, eleven. That's amazing. I usually. Day. Anybody else joining? Some of the people might not have been here for the initial one. Oh, okay, okay. So you go to kahoot.it if you don't know the uh, URL, and you put in the pin. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for the feedback. Okay, let's go in. Okay, I'm gonna start it now. Yep. Five questions, are you ready? Let's do it. AWS Toolkit for Visual Studio provides. Explorer. Uh, we start. don't see your screen. Oh no. Let okay. me... well, I... well, I could see it. You see it? Now, now you did. It was up. No, I stopped it again, and then you know what? I'll I'll stop presenting. You start the. I see it. It just moved and it failed everyone. So <laughs> let me just go back and restart this. Okay, play, teach. Let me get there, and then I'll reshare my screen. Can you guys go back and use this pin now? Let me share the screen. Oh, different pin. Yes, because I killed that game. Six two three two 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 two. Six two three two 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 two. And everybody can see my screen. Okay. Yeah. Looks like we lost two players or they're joining. 
By the way, I recorded part of this, but as happened the last time too, was I was logged in on the wrong account. So I couldn't turn on recordings till I disconnected and reconnected. So I have a, I have a partial recording. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm with recordings. The only statement is point in time. Things can change. Yeah. I'm happy to do multiple times or some other topics that you would want to go more deep into. Okay, so let's get started. First question. AWS Toolkit for Visual Studio provides. What does it provide? It gives you Explorer, project starter templates, deployment wizards, all of the above. So Explorer, starter templates, uh, right tick tick, all of the above. Nice, very good, very simple. Mr. David is leading. You know what? I, sh I should have told this. The faster your response, the more points you get. So it actually is not just who gets right. It also is uh. about who gets it right first. Okay, so congratulations, David and Shikton and Jeff. So let's for the conversation. We'll keep top three. Let's go next. AWS Code Star helps you get started in minutes via setting up your entire development and continuous delivery tool change, just code repo, code pipeline, or issues tracking via Jira. Is it end to end development and continuous delivery tool chain, or just a code repo, or a pipeline, or issue tracking via Jira? Wonderful. It is a quick development and continuous delivery tool chain. So AWS CI CD toolkit. I think I did show a quick demo of it. I leave. Yeah, so let's go in. Code star. Right. This is like pretty neat way of getting started if you want. Like just say new. Whichever language you're working on, choose that. So let's say .NET Core. You give the name of the project. You want to use GitHub, code commit. So it gets you like end-to-end -end CI/CD ready, ready to go very, very quick. Okay, so that's good. Let's go next and see our David still is leading. Ooh. We have a change here, and now we have Dave. Ooh. Let's come up and Dana. Uh, so congratulations. Let's move ahead. I think David is leading by a good amount of points. Legacy.NET Framework ASP.NET application can be run hosted on uh, EC2 only, EC2, Elastic Beanstalk, ECS. Elastic Beanstalk only will need refactoring. Uh, this may be because there is so many services I discussed. I'm pretty mm. sure it's hard to. Oh, wow, that's amazing. We see nine people get that. That's awesome. David still. Oh no, Shake Don comes back. Very good. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Adam has a streak with three correct answers in a row. So congratulations, nice. Adam. And Jeff uh, is coming up. So let's go. I could Two more questions. A, I could send a shirt to the uh, winner. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So there you go. There is something ASP.NET Core app can run host on Lambda only, ECS, ECS, uh, Elastic Beanstalk. I don't know, there's too many of their EC2 only. So .NET Core based app. Nice, very good. People got most of it. David is still checked on Jeff, I think now. You know what, I think last one I put some kind of luck based question. So it doesn't have any logic into it. Uh, let's see, Cherry Jan has the highest answer streak of four. Congratulations, Cherry. Nice. Let's move next. And don't kill me for this question, okay? <laughs> I decide what is your favorite color. <laughs> right? Just like in life, we have 98% effort and 2% luck. I mean, that's again. Right? Good. Oh. Seven people got it right. That's amazing. So I think, David, if you chose blue, then you're probably the leader. Jeff. Oh, we have a surprise winner here. On and I think we had a twist at the last question. Hey, Jeff. So five, six, five, nine is uh, David C. He is, is the winner. Five, one, seven, seven is Sake Don. He's second. And Jeff is five, zero, five, eight, third. So, congratulations. 
and the t-shirt is on your way i guess yeah right? so uh david c is that david cobb anyway uh send me your address and shirt size oh, okay thank you dave thanks thanks for the presentation thank yeah. you guys so so is it what is there anything other people would like to hear about aws i mean for maybe a future presentation this was good that was a good intro to dotnet on aws i thought but there's plenty of there are plenty of places to dig much deeper. Yes, definitely. Obviously, you know, it's like Azure. Definitely it's, it's some of the database stuff. I don't know if that's a database. Old fashioned. Database. Well, yeah, like, like so many different you know services there between DocumentDB and Dynamo and the RDF. And my kids yelling at me. So kind of a survey of the data capabilities and where you might use each one. Something yeah, like well, I mean, you kind of touched on it one of your slides where, you know, depending on what you're doing, like we're, we're kind of in a hybrid place now where we're looking at, you know, some of our, everything's built off a of SQL Server. So we're moving away from some of the RDS and just some more of the document DB, but we've looked at GraphQL. And it's hard to kind of figure out where we would want to go with some of that without spending a lot of money. I'll make note of that. Uh, yeah. If you search for AWS data lake architecture, we have a yeah. reference architecture on it uh, where we go through uh, like getting it on S3 and then from there, either you have a, a data warehouse based workflow. So using kind of Redshift or you could do Athena, Glue, lake mm -hmm. formation based ETL processing, quick site. We've been just setting up some of the notebooks like a Jupyter notebook or just oh, the steps to going through like a small example would be awesome. In cool. my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll probably what I'll do is I'll probably get one of our uh, database specialist uh, who actually works on all the uh, data tier storage services to to do the session uh, for you guys. And maybe we can schedule that next month sometime. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And on .NET, we have like a serverless application specific uh, sessions, uh, authentication authorization uh, for .NET applications. Uh, so I can send a few set of suggested sessions to you, Dave, and if you want to do a kind of a quick poll, you could do that. Okay, sounds good. Any other questions? Comments? Going once. All right, I got to drop off. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Thanks, I'm everyone. Set. Thanks for joining. Thanks a lot, Amit. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate Thanks for good night, everybody. Thanks a lot. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good night, Thank Dave. you. Thank you. Yeah, that was fun, Dave. Yeah. Really How are you doing anyway? Uh, keep busy. The uh, I talked classic last week. I'm doing I get a little bit of consulting work here and there, so it's starting to starting to pick up. Cool. Yeah, I might be able to eat next month. So. Yeah, that's always a always a good thing in consulting. What are you so, printing right now? I'm watching this printer move. Oh, you, you know what? I I replaced my my ceiling fan, and and part of that was, uh, you know, like where the old the bulbs went in the old style thing. So I'm making a uh, so that's I made the base here, and I'm making uh, like a bottom that has says like Noter family, and I'll put some LEDs in the bottom. I don't know. I'm I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do exactly, but I'm making oh, cool. a piece. Of, I'm making a piece of art. That's all. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> oh, that's neat. Yeah, yeah. I've been trying to figure out like how to um, trying to juggle with uh, you know, like the basically doing some consulting stuff, a little bit of training and teaching stuff. Um, and I, I like the volunteering maybe with the user group. Figure out what we can do maybe next month after after Darius's talk. Uh, but did you ever? I got I talked to the, those Teals people. They called me up. I talked to them today. I had like a second review with oh, yeah. that. Looks like I'm gonna go forward with that. Yeah, so I, I, I talked to them too. I told them uh, like, I, there's no way that I'm, I'm not going down in Miami. I don't care. I'm just not gonna do it. I got other yeah. things. But I said I'm happy to help. I can go and do single sessions and things like that. Yeah. So I showed them some of the IoT stuff I was doing. So, but um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Remote should be enough. I mean, for what they're trying to, what they want to do. Yeah, I think remote's probably enough. Could be. 
This is still working. Yeah. I got a new mic here. So this is um set this in here. So it looks like it's like one of these. Oh yeah. And uh, uh I think this sounds a lot better than the little USB mic. Um so it's just sound clear. Do you hear any background sounds stuff? Sounds great, yeah. I can hear uh, some background, like the fan or something. You know what it is? I have a router that has a giant. Um, you know what? I should just take the fans out of the router. So I'm gonna do yeah. Let it, let it burn. Yes. <laughs> burn. I don't know if it really burn. It. <laughs> I'm afraid to. Uh, I don't know if it really. It never feels hot. So uh, I don't know. But yeah, that's yeah, this It's so sensitive that it picks that stuff up. Well, that's one reason I replaced my fan because old clunker. And it bothered me even just working. Rah, 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 rah. And so, uh, so I've been meaning to to replace it. So I just I just ordered a new one, and put it up. So, okay. Of course, I, how much was it? Was it a big expense? It was like I, uh, it was hundred nineteen dollars. I got one. Yeah. Okay. It's a pretty, but it's much more modern. The other one was an old one with the lights that hang down, and it was, it was, it was one of the ones that we had downstairs and replaced like ten years ago. And I moved it up here to replace the one that was even worse 10 years ago. And it was already 10 years old, right? So it's, it's, uh, it was, it was long past its end of life. Okay. So I think, you know, I gotta, I'm looking at a switch here. I think I can actually fix my problem for, I don't know, toys. Yeah. 45 yeah. bucks. Yeah. I don't know. I think, uh, I'd be nice to see what, uh, I don't know what to do next. I'm just so busy with this. Just so, you, so, you, so, you, so you get a uh, shirt. Oh, this awesome. Is the, uh, this is the uh, Blazer Road Show, including uh, all the cities, but he, he only got about to half of them. Okay. And, but on the way, they had, they had shipped, uh, Dev Express had shipped, you know, box, I got four or five big boxes of junk. Oh, yeah. So oh, you yeah. get a bag, get a little Dev Express uh, tchotchke. Oh. Oh, cool! And a yeah, pen, a Dev Express pen. I mean, this is Ooh, this is gold. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything in there that the kids will like? I'll, I'll give it. I have a seven and eleven year old now. I, my, I'll send a couple of these in. Okay, I'll that'll be good. Yeah. <laughs> that'll be cool. Like, actually, yeah. like like the, you know the, uh, I, I had worked with AWS before I left my my other job there. So, um, yeah, and they're doing really cool stuff. It's not. I like Azure more because I'm more comfortable with it. Yeah, me too. Amazon's really amazing. If they could, it's just a little. It's just not as easy. It's just not as easy to figure out. 